B'Shem Hashem Na'asev and Asliyah. Welcome everyone to our weekly shiur on the Zerah Shimshon. Today is, we're going to be doing Parashat Va'et Hanan in the um, portion of Devarim. We're going to be doing Derush Bet, the second ot of the Zerah Shimshon. I have to apologize. Um, sometimes I forget to say what the Derush, which, which of the ots we're doing, and sometimes I get comments on different um, uh, platforms that I didn't say what the ot is, so I apologize. I try my best to say what the ot is every time because there are some people that watch the videos and follow inside afterwards, which is really nice. So welcome everyone far and wide, whoever's here. Welcome whoever's watching online, whether it's Torah Anytime or on uh, YouTube or on Spotify or Google, whatever it is. I don't even know. There's a bunch of platforms that this class goes on, Baruch Hashem. Many places are, um, watch. Um, I would like to remind everyone that if you do have your own Zerah Shimshon stories, success stories of the Segula, please email them to story at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Love getting feedback from everyone, comments. I love the feedback. Thank you very much. So let's go right into it. Parashat Tevarim. Sorry, Parashat Vayet Hanan is the parasha where Moshe Rabbeinu <clears throat> prays to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 515 tefillot, right? 515 different prayers to be able to be let into Eretz Yisrael, to be finally let in, because Hashem told him, sorry, no can do, for whatever reason that we're not going to get into, there's so many different uh, uh, versions of what really it was. If you guys remember, we even did a Zer Shimshon on the fact that Really, it was already predestined that Moshe wasn't able, he was not allowed to go in. God didn't want Moshe Rabbeinu to go, to go to Israel. So really, hitting the rock instead of speaking to that rock, or whatever the reason was that the Torah says that Moshe wasn't allowed to go in, it was like an excuse. Let's call it an excuse. It's a, excuse is not the right word for it, but it was used as the reason for Moshe Rabbeinu not going in. However, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to, he didn't hear that, like... I need to go in. So he prays to HaKadosh Baruch Hu 1,515, sorry, 515 times, which is a lot. So I, I just want to make sure we understand what that is. 515 tefillot, for us, maybe a tefillah, a prayer, let's say we call it the Amida, those of us that do it pretty quick, four minutes, you know, four minute tefillah, I don't want to talk about those that literally finish the Amida in like, I've, I've, I've actually timed people. You, I've, I've timed. I've, I've been in Minyanim where I stood there and I saw the person take his three steps back, go forward, 60 seconds, I kid you not, came back again, went forward. Um, and I, it was very, very, you, those that know me, know how difficult it was for me to hold myself back and not go over to that person and say, I got $100 on the table right now. Do everything you just did out loud, I'll time you. <laughs> it is utterly impossible. You cannot do the Amida in 60 seconds. So anyone that's doing the Amida in 60 seconds definitely is skipping words. Forget words, skipping lines, paragraphs, okay? But hey, you do you, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, I know you are skipping. I'm letting you know there are people behind you that know you are cheating. I just had to say that. That felt amazing. That felt great. Anyway, so Amida, a regular person, let's say fast person, four minutes. If you want to be comfortable doing the prayer of the Amida, six minutes is the normal standard time of the Amida. We're not talking about that with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, you have to imagine like the greatest Kabbalists in the world, the way they do tefillah, in total concentration, 500, 515 times, praying for the same thing in different ways, different versions. It's a lot. So that's what Moshe Rabbeinu did, and the answer was still no. So the Zerah Shimshon says, In Berachot Perek He, the fifth chapter of Tractate Brachot in the Talmud, Page Lamed Bet Amud Bet 32b. 
Amar Rabbi Al-Azhar, Rabbi Al-Azhar says the following, Gedola tefila yoter ma'asim tovim. Prayer is greater than all good deeds. She'ein gadol ma'asim tovim yoter mimoshe Rabbeinu alav shalom. There was no one in the world greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in good deeds. In mitzvot, do you know anyone that was greater than Moshe Rabbeinu? I mean, he was the one... You can't call him the inventor of mitzvot, but he was the one who gave over the mitzvot of the Torah to the nation, right? He's the one who gave the Torah. So we don't know anyone greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. He's the guy who brought it down. He's the guy who taught it to the nation, right? And he had all these mitzvot. He practiced what he preached. So you don't, want, you don't know anyone greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. However, va'afal pichen lo na'ana ena betfilah. Even so, even though Moshe Rabbeinu was so great, he wasn't answered. He wasn't answered except for his tefillot. Meaning, he didn't get any credit for his mitzvot. God didn't just let him go into Israel. We'll see what we're talking about. Because he was so great, because he was so good in keeping the laws of the Torah. No. But the tefillah that he did, his prayer did help. How so? Shene Emar, as it says in the Torah, as it says in the Pasuk, Al Tosef Taber Alai Od. God tells Moses, God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, stop. Do not continue praying. Have you ever heard God ever telling anybody, stop praying? It don't happen. You know? <laughs> it just, the, like, this is the only one of two times that God says, stop praying. Well, it's one and a half, really. The other time that God asked, it was the Jews, when we came out of Egypt and we were stuck in front of the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds, and the Egyptians were following suit behind us, and we started crying to God. And God says, why are you crying to me? Just go forward. And we went forward, and the sea split, right? But even then, God didn't technically say, stop praying. He just said, why are you praying to me? Go forward. Here... Mamash, God says in these words, Al Tosef Taber Elai Od, do not talk to me about this subject anymore. No more prayers. You're done. Right? Usmichle, however, right after God tells Moshe Rabbeinu to stop praying, it says, Ale Rosh Apiska. He orders Moshe Rabbeinu to go on top of the mountain, Sana Enecha, and he tells him to lift up his eyes. And he shows Moshe Rabbeinu the entire Eretz Israel, Not the way we look with a, the greatest camera. Not the way we can see with a, <clears throat> a drone. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens Moshe Rabbeinu's eyes and he gives him a tour of Eretz Israel from outside. He sees everything Israel has from on top of a mountain, but <clears throat> close up, if you could, miraculously showed him everything. Which was something that God did not plan to do. That was not in the plans. Moshe Rabbeinu was not going to be allowed whatsoever to enter Israel. Period. So he's saying here, Rabbi Elazar is saying, Rabbi Elazar is saying what? God told Moshe Rabbeinu you can't go into Israel. And Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest in, if, if you could call him, in mitzvot and ma'asim tovim, in good deeds, and keeping the laws of the Torah, that didn't help him. What did help him when he prayed to God? God said, no, but here's what you will get though. I changed my mind. I will show you Israel through and through. And that's what God did for him. Did for him. <coughs> now, Vekatua Tosafot, that first of all shows you the power of tefillah. That shows you the strength of prayer. But we're going to delve more into it. The Tosafot over there, the commentary to Safot questioned this and write in Gemara Brachot, they, they write, Gedola tefila mi ma'asim tovim belo tefila. To Safot say, you know what this Gemara actually means? It means that prayer is greater than good deeds without prayer. Meaning if you're a tzaddik, if you're a righteous person and you don't pray, you're not going to get much. Don't think that you're going to get something just because you're righteous. Saying, 
What he's really saying is, the Tosafot say, the tefillah that comes combined with righteousness is the greatest thing. Gedola tefillah mima'asim tovim belo tefillah. Meaning, tefillah itself is greater than if you have good deeds without tefillah. Good deeds alone are not going to help you. That's what we learn from Moshe Rabbeinu. Good deeds alone didn't help him. He was at a situation where he needed something else to help him go in. Yes, it didn't help him go in for different reasons, but he did get something extra. He did experience seeing Eretz Yisrael like no one else had, through and through. So now, he says as follows. You following, Brandon? Good. You're good, okay. Everybody else following so far? We're good? Oleg? Yeah. All right, good. Makshim, the commentaries ask. How does Rabbi Elazar in the Gemara learn from here that prayer is greater than good deeds? How does he learn that out? Maybe righteousness and prayer are equal. Who says prayer is greater than good needs? And the reason Moshe was not answered until he prayed, And maybe Moshe Rabbeinu was not answered for his request yet so far, because, okay, <clears throat> when you don't have, when you only have good deeds and you don't have tefillah, it doesn't help. Fine. But tefillah combined with good, good deeds does help. So that doesn't tell me that tefillah is greater than good deeds. That's not what it tells me. It could, it could just tell me that tefillah, prayer, is equal to good deeds. <coughs> tefillah itself might not help by itself. Maybe you need both of these things. So how does Rabbi al know that tefillah is actually greater than good deeds? It says, moreover, the reef asks, Rabbi al disregarded a main proof, a main evidence to the idea that Moshe Rabbeinu finally got to see Eretz Yisrael in the merit of his prayers. Why? Because... What does Rabbi Al-Azhar use to prove that Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, uh, prayers were answered? What pasuk did he use? It says, God told him, Al Tosef Taberalai. Do not talk about this anymore. And Rabbi Al-Azhar says, from here we see Moses was answered. You don't see from there Moses was answered. From here you see God said, just enough. Right? <laughs> That's not where you see that Moses' tefillah was answered. That's where God was telling him, stop. I don't want you to pray anymore. You're done. It says, <clears throat> so the Rif says, why doesn't Rabbi al use the other Pesukim that actually proved that Moshe was answered? Which is what? The beginning of the Parsha this week says, Va'et Hanan and Hashem. And Moshe Rabbeinu prayed to God. And then later it says, Ale Rosh God says to Moshe, okay, come up the mountain. I'll, I'll show you Eretz Yisrael. From there, you could prove easily that Moses was answered. Why are you choosing to prove to me that Moses was answered from the opposite? From the pasuk that says, God asked Moses to stop talking. You understand the question? Okay. says, you're bringing a evidence from a pasuk, from a passage that is showing the exact opposite here. <coughs> because over there it says, stop talking to me. Which means, it shows, it implies that Hashem did not answer his prayer possibly. That's what the Rif asks. Moreover, says also, Tosafot's answer is difficult as well. For what, what was bothering Tosafot to be pushed to comment as they did? Isn't it, it's obvious. What, what did we say? Tosafot said that Prayer with good deeds is, is very strong. So this is like, obviously. Like, I don't need you to tell me that. I know if you're righteous and you pray well, you got both of those things going for you. So I don't need the commentary to tell me, you know what's the greatest? Prayer 
and good deeds. I know that. That's no like, that's not such great idea that you're teaching me now. It says that prayer is greater than good deeds is, hold on one second. Peshita, it's, it's obvious. The gdola tefillah me'asim tovim arab lo tefillah. It's obvious that the statement, prayer is greater than good deeds, is referring to good deeds without prayer. For how could you think that it's discussing good deeds together with tefillah? That when that would mean, what? That one factor, meaning prayer, is greater than two factors, good deeds and uh, accompanied with prayer. So now, I know it's a little bit like difficult to follow, but you know how the, there are those of you that are here more weeks, Zer Shimshon always starts a little difficult and then it mellows down into answering all the questions well. It says, Uldidan nir'e Pashut be'ur kavanat rabbi al-azhar It says, it's obvious to explain what Rabbi al-Azhar in the Gemara actually meant. First we must examine Why was it necessary for Rabbi Al-Azhar to prove from Moshe Rabbeinu that prayer is greater than good deeds? Why was that necessary? This is something very very simple and clear We know that Hashem listens to all prayers Always. Why do I need Rabbi Al-Azhar to tell me, yes, God listens to all tefillot, especially if you're righteous. Why do I need that? Why? He brings even non-Jews. When they pray, Hashem listens. You don't need to be righteous. You don't need to be Jewish. You don't even non-Jews. It doesn't matter. Prayer is prayer. You're praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're in need. Hashem always listens. It says, even a burglar that is about to rob a house or a business, before he goes in to rob and he prays outside, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please help. I'll be successful to break this lock and I'll be successful to get into that big safe and I don't get caught. <laughs> Guess what? It works. It works. It really does. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, listen, this is my child. He's doing something really, really wrong. But right now he's asking for my help. Right now he needs my help. What can I tell you? And in the Gemara there are stories of, there, there, there are stories of thieves that used to pray. Mamash, imagine, before they go and rob a place, they used to pray. Ma'aminim, they believed in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but what can you do? Business is business. Right? You know, that was their business. I believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but I do believe that if you don't lock your doors. <laughs> you know, I told you guys that, um, I don't know if I shared this with you guys or not. It's not so relevant here, but it's a thief. So thief, it's a thief. There was a thief that was having a discussion with a, a, the Rav of his city. And they knew he was a thief. Jewish guy. So the Rav tells him, listen, let me ask you, um, do when, you, when you go to like steal and stuff, like, do you also go, do you also go and steal like on Shabbat? So he says, Kvod Rav, listen, I'm a businessman, all right? I try not to work on Shabbat, <laughs> but if the opportunity arises, and somebody that's worth it, you know, comes along and leaves their home and they're on vacation and it's the only Shabbat I got. What can I tell you? You know, I got to do what I got to do. So maybe I won't break so many Shabbat laws. I'll try to figure out not to carry my tools with me. I'll leave my tools there before Shabbat. So I don't do carrying in the Eruv because I don't hold of the Eruv. <laughs> right? So he says, okay. So he says, uh, how about Yom Tov? Like Chagim, Pesach, Sukkot, I mean Chagim, people celebrate the Chagim. 
He says, yeah, I understand. I try, I try my best to be with my family during the Chagim. Pesach, my family goes away to Taiwan in the Pesach program over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I made that up. No one, no one does that. <laughs> I'm kidding. No sane person. I'm kidding. Um, so it says, but again, if the opportunity comes up and, 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 and the loot is big enough, yeah, I'll do it. <coughs> so he says, wow. So he says, do you differentiate between like brothers and non-brothers, like Jews, non-Jews? Do you differentiate? He says, listen, Kuvod Arav, green is green. Money's money. You know? If it's money, who cares who I'm taking it from? It's my business. What I do, Jew and I, I said, I understand. Eh, I got to do what I got to do. So finally the Rav says, um, so when you go into these homes, like, how long does it sometimes take you to like rob the place? Go sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes you go, I got a lot of things, <laughs> right? So he says, um, "Do you get hungry while you're there?" And he says, "Yeah, sure. Sometimes I do get hungry. I get tired. I get hungry." He says, "Do you ever go to the fridge and and take out food also to eat?" He says, "Yeah, sometimes I do. I'm there. I mean, it's my home for the next two hours. So what are you gonna do? I go to the fridge and take what I can, right?" So he goes. So how about if it's not kosher? Do you also eat non-kosher in, in, a, in a home if it's non-kosher? He goes, Kvod Arav, I'm very sorry. I'm a thief, not a guy. What do you think of me? You know, I get it, I'm a thief, but eating not kosher? Never, right? So I don't know if this is a true story or not. Heard it a long time ago. But it just brought out the fact that some people have their things. You know what I mean? Some of us are like, okay, they're a thief, but they're a glad kosher thief. <laughs> you know, they'll go to the fridge, be like, I don't, I'm really hungry. I could really go for some milk and cereal. But, uh, it's not Chalav Israel. It's these like Trader Joe's organic milk. <laughs> what is this? I need it to be Chalav Israel. All right, maybe I'll have some bread. Ah, oh, but the bread is not Pat Israel. And it's not Yashan. Oh, uh, maybe their meat is not RCC. Is it RCC? Is it this? Da, da, da. <laughs> they could have so many different nicks and knacks, but they're a thief. Right? They could be a thief. And this goes for anything. I'm using the example of a thief. Sometimes we're so many different, like, there's so many different things that we do wrong. But then we have these little tiny things that we stick to. And I'm not saying it as a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Judaism is not, it's either all or nothing. Right? It's not. It's not an all or nothing religion whatsoever. Whatever you do is good. I call them anchors. You know how an anchor keeps a ship exactly where it's stationed? But then it's not that the ship doesn't move at all. Right? The ship circulates around the anchor. Because the anchor is stationed below. And the ship just moves around where the anchor is in a circular motion. You might not feel it, but that's what happens. So those little tiny things that we keep, even if we're not keeping everything, those, becomes our, those become our anchors in life. No matter how far out you go, you're going to come back to those anchors. And soon enough, those mitzvot could be the ones that will save a person from the greatest, greatest averot. Those anchors could be the ones that will save the person from going completely off and even becoming closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So a person, a Jew, should never feel like a hypocrite. Like, I don't keep anything. What, I should put on tefillin today all of a sudden? I'm such a hypocrite. No, no, no. No, put on tefillin. That's great. You don't keep anything out. You don't keep kashrut, but you want to put on tefillin? Put on tefillin. You don't put on tefillin, but you want to keep kosher? Keep kosher. You don't, you don't keep Shabbat, but you want to keep kosher? Keep kosher. You keep Shabbat, but you don't keep kosher? But whatever you got, keep it. Even if you feel bad about it, that's just the yetzer hara. That's just the evil inclination trying to fool you. Because a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Do what you can. Do what you can. I remember Rabbi Gottlieb one time told me, that had a student of his that became a believer. Right? He, he wanted to start keeping stuff. He's like, all right, you know what? Judaism is the truth. The Torah is the truth. I, I'm, I'm game. But here's the problem. I'm a big football, camp, football fan. And the greatest football games, I guess, I don't know, then, and now, I don't, I don't, I don't watch football, Baruch Hashem. Um, he says, it's 
the best games are on Friday nights. Right? Is it Friday nights or Saturday mornings? Fo- football. Saturdays? Football's on Saturdays. Football's on Shabbat. How am I supposed to be Jewish and keep Shabbat when I, I can't do it? I have to watch football on Shabbat. So I got, he told them, you know what? Is there football on Friday night? No. All right, so keep Friday nights. You can't keep Shabbat day? No problem. At least you got Friday night. You don't have to desecrate the Friday night. So make a pact with yourself. I'm going to keep Friday nights. I'm going to have Kiddush with my family. Da-da. Shabbat, Friday nights. The next day is Saturday. It's not Shabbat anymore. I'm just going to watch my football game. And he agrees. And it takes a few months. After a few months, he starts keeping Shabbat altogether. He realized, like, I, I enjoy the Friday night so much. I want to have more of it. And it kind of helps you go to the next level yourself. So keeping the mitzvot, even the small ones, it counts. We should never think like, ah, oh, what am I doing doing this right now? I don't keep anything else. Why should I do this? That's the Yetzar Hara. Anyway, going back. So he says, even, uh, do, we don't need this evidence that tefillah works. Because obviously it does. What the, why does Rabbi Al-Azhar need Moshe Rabbeinu to prove to us that tefillah works? We know tefillah works even for thieves. <coughs> last week, last week, wasn't it last week that we discussed how the Kohen Gadol, oh, we might have not mentioned it, but a person that kills someone by accident would be sent to the cities of refuge and they would only come out if the Kohen Gadol would die. And the Gemara says, you know who would take care of those people that were in exile? The mother of the Kohen Gadol. She would make food for them. If they have had any needs, she would take care of them. These were accidental killers, right? Why is the mother of the Kohen Gadol the one who helps them? Because she knew what? They won't pray that the Kohen Gadol dies. Right. She knew that their only escape plan is if the Kohen Gadol dies, which is her son. So she would do these favors for them, for them not to pray for the Kohen Gadol to die. Because imagine... They're in exile. They're sitting there going every single day, Hashem, please, please, the Kohen Gadol is the only one between me and my freedom. <coughs> right? So you have to ask yourself, what, Hashem's going to listen to them and kill the Kohen Gadol? The answer is yes. Tefillah is that powerful that if it comes from a broken heart, if it comes from the bottom of the heart, you never know. It might have that crack in the heavens and it's going to get through. So here, the Zera Shimshon is asking, why do I need Moshe Rabbeinu to prove to me that tefillah works? Right? <clears throat> Hashem listens to the tefillah of a person even if that person is wicked. Wicked. Guys, we have to understand the, the power that we have. None of us here are wicked. Guaranteed. No one watching this shiur is wicked. We're not reshaim. Do you understand how much power we have in our lips to pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the needs of Am Yisrael and ourselves? If the wicked rasha has the power to pray to Hashem for what he wants, how much do you think power we have? Just recognize that. So he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu listens to all the tefillot in the case of good deeds, however, it is necessary to be filled full of mitzvot and good deeds to gain connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Tefillah, you don't even need to be a tzaddik. You could be a rasha and connect instantly with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But if you want to use your righteousness to be connected to Hashem, you got to work really hard. If you want to only use your mitzvot to connect to Hashem, oh, you better be working hard. You want that real connection? That etrog better be the $200 etrog. That tefillin or that, that, that whatever it is that you are doing as a mitzvah on yourself, oh, better be good. Right? You really want that connection that a prayer does. Because if you don't, if you don't have enough of those mitzvot, <coughs> it becomes nullified. 
because of their small quantity. And listen to this. And especially, certainly, if that person is a regular sinner in one matter, you know what it means to be a regular sinner in one matter? A repeat offender. A repeat offender is worse than someone that makes different kinds of mistakes. If you know something is an avera and it's wrong, and you keep doing that avera, that becomes what is pulling the person literally straight to get Gehinam. That repeat offender. Because you're constantly doing the same avera and it's becoming natural to you. The fact that it becomes natural to you, it pulls you even more further down. Therefore, imagine this person has so many different mitzvot. A person has so many different good deeds, right? But there's one thing that he's just not gotten around to. And it's that one avera that they're constantly doing, right? For instance, nobody does this, so I'm just going to use this example because no one does this. Lashon hara, speaking negatively about other people. I know, it's, it's, it's a far-fetched problem, very far-fetched, but hey, let's use this as an example, yeah? Imagine the guy, the person has Shabbat, Tereti, Machmir, you're strict on everything during Shabbat, right? Your Shabbats are like, wow. You know, toilet paper is pre-cut from before Shabbat, and like, you don't wash any of your dishes because you don't want to prepare, and nah, nah. You don't even put your lights on timers because you're like, woo, right? You're very machmir, but you're constantly speaking Lashon Hara. That's what's pulling you down. All the Shabbat that, you're, you're, that, that, that you are observing with all the stringencies is great, but it's, but it's being severed. The connection is being severed from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because you're a repeat offender. You're constantly making that same mistake over and over when you know it's wrong. And then you have all these excuses. Rabbi, it's not Lashon Hara because it's true. I love that one. That's my favorite one. It's true. It's not Lashon Hara. They don't ask like, Rabbi, even if it's true, it's Lashon Hara. No, 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 no. They teach you. <laughs> they go, Rabbi, you might not know this. This is not Lashon Hara. I'm sorry. I would never speak real Lashon Hara. Who do you think I am? I'm telling you the truth. This guy is an idiot. <laughs> Trust me. I can't lie. I'm being very truthful. It's a fact. Check, I googled it. It says this guy, is, like everybody knows. Right? No, that's the definition of Lashon Hara. If you, will, if you were lying, that's Motsi Shemra. That's a grade worse than Lashon Hara. Right? There's, that's a different level. If you say Lashon Hara, you're bad. If you say Motsi Shemra, you are wicked bad. Like bad with two Ds. Right? It's, it, it's like that. So if a person, so he says, especially if, if a person wants to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through their good deeds, those good deeds better be squeaky clean. Because if you're doing all the mitzvot there is, but you're like constantly lacking in one on purpose, your, your connection is very shaky. But tefillah doesn't work like that. He says, I'll say it in Hebrew. For those who understand Hebrew, so I'm not making this up. Those good deeds are not considered zilch when you have those defects in them. Zilch. Again, it's not that you're not going to get reward for your ma'asim tovim. You're not, it's not that you're not going to get rewarded for your mitzvot. You're going to get the reward. But the connection they're supposed to have to bring that shefa for you, to bring those blessings for you, that you're missing. It's not automatic. It's not going to be automatic through your deeds. Ella, <coughs> so he says, says, no, so now, since now, we understand that tefillah is definitely greater 
prayer is definitely greater than ma'asim tovim, than good deeds, we have to understand what is Rabbi Al-Azhar really trying to teach us in the Gemara. What are you trying to prove to me that tefillah is greater? We already know. El avadai tzarich lomar, we must say, shekavanat Rabbi Al-Azhar hi, that the intent of Rabbi Al-Azhar means to say, shekidola tefillah levadda, that prayer has greatness of its own. Yoter mikola ma'asim tovim sheba'olam chutz mitfilah. Which is more than all the good, uh, uh, all the good mitzvot, all the good deeds in the world combined when they are without tefillah. This is why the tosvot say without tefillah. Good deeds without tefillah, you ain't got nothing. And tefillah by itself is greater than all the good deeds itself. When you want that direct connection to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. For the discussion here is about one who fulfills all the mitzvot. However, the person does all the mitzvot, but he doesn't pray for his needs. Rabbi al means to teach that even the great merit of all those mitzvot that he has combined is not going to guarantee those, that person's wants and desires. It's not going to guarantee that they're fulfilled. In the same way that tefillah does. O mishum hachi, then therefore, hutzrach lahavira ayah davka mi Moshe. Therefore, Rabbi El Azar decided to bring this proof from none other than Moshe. Why? Bedayek shapi lomar shein lecha gadol maasim tovim yoter mi Moshe Rabenu alav shalom. That's why he meant to say it the way he said it in the Gemara. He says, there is no one better than Moshe Rabbeinu when it comes to mitzvot and ma'asim tovim. You know anyone else that did the mitzvot better than Moshe Rabbeinu? You don't. So mitzvot and great deeds, he definitely had, right? Did that help him to go to Eretz Yisrael? It didn't. Did that help him see Israel? No, it didn't. What did? Tefillah. So he says, Rabbi al on purpose chose the example of Moshe Rabbeinu. He could have chosen the thief. And said, look, look how powerful tefillah is. Even the thief is answered. But he didn't choose that. So that's not good enough. I'm going to show you that the greatest person with all the mitzvot, even he, it couldn't help him without tefillah. Tefillah is on a different realm. It's on a different plateau. It's a different thing. Tefillah is what, prayer is what connects us to our Father in Heaven. It's what connects us to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay? You could be the greatest child at home. You never make any mistakes. Right? You're a goody two-shoe. Your room is always clean. You separate your laundry on, on your own. Right? I'm just, I'm going to be la- just kind of like, I have kids. Um, your laundry is always separated by color. The whites are there. The blacks are in another basket. They're never on the floor. Your dirty clothes, never. Um, you make your bed every single morning yourself. You cook for the family every day. A new meal. I mean, you are perfect. Mamash, everything you do at home is great. You give rides to your parents. You give rides to your siblings. You changed your dad's tires and you're a girl. Like, it's crazy, right? Crazy. But you don't talk to your dad. You're great. But you don't talk to your mom. What do you have to say? How does that work? Which one's better? Which one would you think your mom or your dad would rather have? Changing the tire or talking to them. I don't think anybody would say any different. This is what this is saying. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, all the good deeds, yes, 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 those are the mitzvot I asked you to do, they're great, you're going to get rewarded for them. But if you want a, 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 a relationship with me, I want you to talk to me, cry to me, pray to me, talk to me. That's what I want. That's the most powerful thing. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu can't stand it. As if, kaviachol, if you could say. You know, it's like Hashem is saying, as long as you're talking to me, I'll get you whatever you want. Because I want this relationship. I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know that I love my relationship with you. How do I do that? By giving you what you want. 
Yes, you're a thief. It's bad. It's really bad. But at least you're talking to me. But at least I have a relationship with you. At least you know I'm here. You know, they say in, 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 in Torah law, which is worse, a thief or a robber? Do you know the difference between a thief and a robber? <coughs> Not rubber, robber. Do you know the difference between a thief? A thief is someone that goes at night or waits for the family to leave the house or whatever. They hide and they go in and they rob and come out. A robber is by gunpoint. You know, broad daylight. Everybody down. Yeah, you're, you're being robbed. Right? That's Hasu Shalom. That's a robber. Which one is worse in halachic terms? A robber. The thief. The thief. Why? Because the robber says, listen, I don't care who sees, who don't. Or that. This is, it, it is what it is. I'm doing it. Right? The thief hides as if no one sees. It acts as if HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't see either. Naturally, when it's hiding behind places and waiting and lurking in the dark, waiting for, for, for the people of the house to leave their house and drive away, it's as if it's saying, I'm waiting for God to drive away too. He won't see me when I'm like, no. Subconsciously, that's, that's, what, that, that's you know? But when a thief goes to steal things from someone's house and before they do, they pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they're basically attesting to the fact that, listen, I'm not hiding from you. I know you're watching. All right? So here's the deal. They're going to get robbed because they just left and I'm here. So let's talk. Okay? I won't take everything, but you on your end, make sure the alarm doesn't go off. All right? Thank you. Amen. I'm going in. You know? I don't, I'm just saying... I, that, that, that's, I'm not saying I've ever watched a thief pray, right? But this is what we just said. The, the proof is that even, even, even a thief that has a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is beloved for that relationship and is answered. And that's answered. It's ridiculous when you think about it, but hey, that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. I want a relationship for you. Now, that doesn't mean that that thief is not going to get punished for that, for that robbery. That's 100%. That's a different account on its own. That's different. When, when, is, when is his tefillot going to run out? Probably at some point. Hashem's going to say, listen, not this time. Okay? You're like, chutzbah. You know? One time, two times, five times, ten times. Okay, you prayed. But I think now you're pulling my leg already. Like, this is a bank. <laughs> We're not, I'm not helping you rob a bank. Thing. Like, it comes to a point when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, all right, you know what? Forget about it. You know, if, if Hashem was Italian. <laughs> so. <laughs> so therefore, hold on, I lost my place. As always. Sorry, one second. Okay, I think, so the next part of the Zer of Shimshon goes into something else. But we'll try to continue. Moshe. Now regarding the prayer of Moshe, it says, and Moshe prayed to Hashem, and Rashi says, even though that the righteous people can use 
their good deeds to gain things in life. They don't use that ever. Righteous people do, exactly. Righteous people never say, listen, Hashem, I've been righteous all my life. I've given so much tzedakah. I've helped the community so much. Please, you know, let's be good. The righteous never do that. They ask to receive things as a gift, as a free gift. Meaning, don't deduct from my rewards. I want my rewards when, after 120 years, I want the real, legit rewards. So don't pay me here for anything. When I pray for things that I want, don't take that away from my ma'asim tovim. Don't give me things because I've been good. If you're going to give me anything, give it to me as a free gift. Vakadosh Baruch Hu Amar Lo. So now, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu. So therefore, Moshe, has, Moshe also wanted that Hashem should grant his desire on account of his prayers. He didn't want to have it deduct from his ma'asim tovim. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him, Al tosef taber elai. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't speak to me any further about this. Why? Because Hashem wanted Moshe to die in the wilderness. He did not want Moshe to even pray to enter the land of Israel. So that in order not to diminish the power of tefillah. Imagine, you know, people could turn around and say, look, even Moses... He prayed so much, and Hashem never answered his tefillah. Right? So, prayers, you know, what are they good for? Therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe Rabbeinu, I, want, I need you to stop. You can't keep going. Because what's going to happen is, I cannot let you go into Israel. And if I keep saying no to you, other generations are going to think that prayer doesn't work. They're not going to know how p- powerful prayer is because of you. You have a question, Brandon? Yeah, so if that's the case, why did he let him do it 515 times? If that's the case, why did he let him do it 515 times? Good question. He didn't want people to say that tefillah has no koach. I told you, you ask good questions, I'll ignore you. Okay? Don't put me on the spot. I'm sorry, it's a good question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> However, on the other hand, Hashem did answer his tefillah. <laughs> so far as it didn't contradict his decree, <laughs> that's why Hashem told him, okay, fine. I'll bring you up on the mountain and I'll show you all of Eretz Yisrael. <clears throat> And that was connected to stop praying. Therefore, here we learn he received this gift because of his tefillah. Hashem told him, stop. I don't want you to pray anymore because it's going to make people think that prayer doesn't work. But in order for me to take that idea out of people's heads, not to think that prayer is worthless, I'm going to give you something that I did not want to give you. Which is what? I'm going to show you Eretz Israel. It's as if you've been there. A 4D experience of all of Eretz Israel. You could literally touch and feel it, but you're just not there. And that's the experience he gave him. Therefore, okay, and from here, uh, I think we're going to stop it here because I don't, want, I don't want everyone to get more confused. So from here, from here we see a few things. Number one, there's a different shot also about why Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to stop praying, which is one of the common answers as to why Hashem asked them to stop, which Moshe Rabbeinu learned from here that if I had continued just one more time, Hashem would have been forced to let me go in. Therefore, Hashem, or else Hashem could have just let Moshe Rabbeinu go on another thousand times. If I don't want, I don't want. If I said, you're not going in, you're not going in, keep praying. You're not bothering me. What, you think Hashem's ears were hurting? Like, ah, stop it already. Like, you go, Hashem doesn't get annoyed, chas shalom, right? So why did Hashem ask Moshe Rabbeinu to stop praying? Moshe Rabbeinu learned from here. 
And he taught this to Bnei Israel till today. That's why we pray. Multiple times about the same thing. Because he said, Hashem taught me. By the fact that he asked me to stop, it meant that he was almost about to let me go in, but he knew that he can't. So he asked me to stop. And we've, we've covered this in different classes before as to why Moshe Rabbeinu could not go into Israel. One of the answers was that if he would go, he would build the Beit HaMikdash, and that Beit HaMikdash would never be destroyed, and that was not a good thing for Am Yisrael. Because when the Jews sinned, they had to be punished. And that punishment was the destruction of that building. But if that building was indestructible, who would get punished? So Hashem was telling Moshe Rabbeinu, I can't let you go into Israel. You cannot. Not this time around. Right? So stopping him meant, if I let you pray more, I'll have to change the fabric of my creation. That's not in the plan. It's not in the game plan. It can't happen. Not now. Right? That's how powerful our tefillot are. And the Gemara Brachot also says, Gemara Brachot says that, I think it's in Brachot or Shabbat, if I'm not mistaken. It says there is a powerful, powerful tool that everyone has, but they don't know that they have it. And the Gemara asks, what is this powerful tool that everybody has, they don't even know how to have it? And the Gemara answers, that's the power of tefillah, power of prayer. We don't know how much power our prayers have. We think just because it didn't get answered today, it didn't get answered tomorrow, it didn't get answered in a year, Ah, it's not powerful. But you don't know that. Tefillah is never wasted. A person's prayers are never wasted. They go up. And they go into a special closet, a special room. They're saved up. They could be saved up for generations. Because in this lifetime, this person could not have what they were asking for. But that doesn't mean they're wasted. Their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren all of a sudden get these blessings that they never thought even they deserved. I've always said, like, I take myself for an example. I always tell people, everything I have is from my grandparents and my parents. Because the life that we have, come on. You know, I remember my grandmother, Allah shalom. You know, and my grandfather, Allah shalom. These people were so... Their emunap shuta, their faith in Akadosh Baruch Hu was so solid. They lived a life of hardship, real hardship, and their emuna in Hashem was unbreakable, unbreakable. Every word in their mouth was at filah. Every word. Every time they would talk to you, there was another prayer going out at you. May Hashem do this for you. May Hashem do that for you. Every time. And the things they did for the community, the risks of their lives. I mean, uh, living in a Muslim country full of hatred. You know, being, being chased in the streets. Literally. And all those tefillot. And you might ask, like, they lived in hardship still. They had very hard lives. Uh, very poor lives. Very poor. So what happened? The answer is, all of a sudden the next generation lives in California, buys meat from a supermarket, you know, all shechted and cleaned and glad kosher and everything. Do you know what my grandmother, even my mother, she did well, till what, 30 years ago. You know what they had to do to have kosher meat and chicken? It was a process. <laughs> it was a process. First you had to go buy the live chicken. Go and find the rabbi that shechts the chicken. Shecht the chicken. And then take that chicken home. Pluck all the feathers. Kosher it. Salt it. Do all those things that mothers, the old school mothers knew how to do that today, some rabbis in Kosher industries don't even know that well, <laughs> right? Salt it, cut it up, prepare it, and then feed. Today, you go to a market, different parts of the chicken are just packaged up for you. 
already koshered and stamped and everything. That's how they lived. Life was hard. And they always prayed. And we feel that sometimes, like, okay, where did these prayers go? Where did they go? Right? Prayers are always answered. They're always answered. Sometimes at that moment, the answer is no. But 20 years, 30 years, 50 years down the line, all of a sudden these brachot come out of nowhere for other people. What do you think? It's you? You think it's us? I don't think it's me. Right? What? It's like, come on. The lives they had, the emunah they had in those lives. You know, they, they worshipped HaKadosh Baruch Hu while being beaten in the streets. And they still prayed to Hashem. And those prayers were powerful. Powerful. You know, my grandfather, I think, had two broken ribs from a punch from a Muslim in the street. Um, he had rocks thrown at him multiple times. It's just, that was regular life. That's how they lived. But at the same time, oh my gosh. But at the same time, their emunah, their faith in Hashem, unbreakable. Their tefillot, the way they would talk to you, the things that they would say to you, every, every other word was a, was a bracha, was a blessing. You know, I, was, I just came back from Eretz Yisrael and we went to a, um, I forget the city's name. Uh, I forget the name of the city. But it's an old city that has the, what they believe, uh, which many believe, is the cave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Not the resting site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Huh? Is it Marco? That's not what the city is called. It's in Eretz Yisrael. It's, it's in Israel. <coughs> right now, it's a, it's a city of, uh, where most of the people that live in that city of Drew, are, are Druze. Um, so the cave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the cave that he sat in with his son for 12 years, 13 years, the cave is there. And then below, when you go into the city, there's little tiny shuls and stuff like that. And there is one lady, one Jewish lady that lives in this city. Very old lady. She's in, I think she might even be 100. Okay? She has pictures from like, she's been kicked out of Israel already twice with her family two different pogroms and stuff that she went through. She, they had to be kicked out. They came back. And she lives in the city that she was literally born in. Right? She, she's literally a museum. She lives in a museum. People go and she speaks to them. And there's pictures of her grandparents. Da, 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 da. I tell you, like, I watched her speak. It was like watching my grandmother. Every other word was a bracha. Every other word was a bracha. I couldn't even, I wasn't even listening to her stories. I was just waiting for her to be done so I can go up to her and get a bracha. Just, just a regular old lady, no hacham, no. I went up to her and get a bracha. And then I went up to her afterwards, I asked for her a bracha. She gave me a bracha. I called my mother and I said, you won't believe, I, I sent some pictures. We have this family chat. So I put some pictures in our family chat of her. Like the whole family already. My mom, first one. Who is this lady? She already knew like, whoa. She like saw something. I'm like, yeah, it's this like very, very old lady. First question, did you get a bracha from her? Right? Because you know who these people are. People that have lived through these kind of lives and remain Jewish and remain connected. Those are the ones that give us the energy to be who we are today. And we can't just throw that away. We have to do better. We have to be more connected because they sacrificed everything for us. They mamash gave everything for us to be who we are today. Baruch Adonai le'olam. Amen ve'amen.